it is a huge honor today to be interviewing a rock star in dentistry, an idol of mine for probably 25 years. I think I like I, I've, I've been following you and your uh, gorgeous husband, the bald, the other bald guy, Ross Nash. How are you You're doing today? Good. good. We're working. We're rocking. Busy. Finishing up the year. Finishing up the yeah. year. And how, is, how has your year been? What, what, have you, what have you been doing all year? Well, well um, been a busy year. Practice has been busy. Consulting's been busy. Uh, speaking's been busy. It's been, um, gosh, I've been on the road uh, working with clients working with uh, audiences, and uh, as I still work in the office. So, you know, what makes me different, and I know you know this, is that you know, I still work in the, in the dental practice a couple days a week. So every day I get to practice what I preach. And, Deborah, um, let's start off um, with a macroeconomic view. You've been, you've been doing this for, what, 20 years, 30 years? How long have you been? Oh, over 30 years. Over it's hard to believe. Over oh. 30 years. And, 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 older uh, than dirt. I want to start with what is the state of dentistry today in, as opposed to when you got into this industry 30 years ago? Is, is, is becoming a dentist today as good as it was when Ross and I both graduated a long time ago? Or is, are there more challenges? Is it the same? What, what is the state of the industry now as opposed to when you first entered it? Wow. Um, I think it's different than it was. I think it's better than it was when you and Ross got started. Really? I do. I is that do. just because you're always an optimist or is that, or is that founded in reality? I think, um, I think one of the reasons is, uh, and I, I have to liken that to uh, public awareness. I think, I think our consumer, uh, our dental consumer is more savvy today than when you and Ross were uh, for starting, I mean, most dentists back, most patients back then went into the dentist because all of a sudden they realized that there was a dental plan linked to their health plan that they didn't even know they had, um, and so they went in for kind of pretty basic stuff. And I and I think um, back then um, that what the, the the treatment options were fairly basic. Now I think the options, dental treatment options, um, are much greater than they were 30 plus years ago. I think there are um, opportunities for a dentist to be uh, a dental entrepreneur, uh, for a dentist to be, and let's face it, a dentist to be an employer. Uh, you know, we can't look at um, DSOs and, and uh, uh, big box dental corporation dentistry as, as bad things, they're things. So now I think there are a lot of options for dentists today, more options than there were. I think the majority of the dentists, uh, when you and Ross were babies in the industry, were pretty much private practice. Well, now there's many more opportunities for dentists. I think you can be just about anything you want in dentistry today. You can be the niche brand practice if you want. You can be the, uh, the associate if you want. You can be uh, a corporate dentist if you want. So look at all the opportunities there are now that there weren't back then. And I want to ask you one other uh, historical macroeconomic question. Do you think dentists coming out of school today are better prepared to be a leader and a small business owner than they were 30 years ago? Or is it pretty much the same where they come out with all technical skills and no geometry and calculus and physics and have no idea who this dental assistant is standing in front of them wanting a raise? That's, that's, that's a big difference. And unfortunately, I think they're not prepared. They're not prepared to be business owners. The difference is they're prepared to be techno geeks. Um, they, in fact, we we're talking to a, a, a dean in one of the dental schools, and he said one of the problems with a lot of the young dentists is they don't have tactile skill because they never built a plane model. They never played with their fingers. They played uh, with a joystick. They played on a computer. So uh, all the new computer stuff, you know, the CAD CAM stuff and the model scanning and all of that is great for them. But people skills um, is not one of the things they were taught. They weren't taught when you and Ross went to dental school, but you had to learn them. Um, and this is, I think this is still one of the things that is greatly lacking in dental school. And when I, I have actually offered, I've done this before in some dental schools where I've offered to go into the junior senior classes and talk to them about what it's really like to be a dentist. I mean, technical skill is one thing, but now you've got people skills and personnel issues on top of that. And dental schools will say, 
gee, Deborah, we'd love to have you, but we don't have time. They're learning. They're, they're busy. They're too busy to learn this stuff. So they're going to have to go in and learn trial by fire. So what, what are the, um, so in your 30 years, in fact, in fact I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't even read your intro. That, that's disrespectful. Deborah, I don't care. Deborah Englehart Nash has been in dentistry and healthcare related fields for over 30 years. She has presented workshops nationally and internationally for numerous study groups and organizations. She is a repeat presenter for the American Dental Association, the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, as well as Chicago Dental Society Midwinter Meeting. Deborah writes for a number of dental publications. She has been honored twice as author of the year for her contributions to dental journals. Deborah was also an instructor for the Central Piedmont Community College Dental Assisting Program and a guest instructor for Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry. She is a founding member and served two terms as president of the National Academy of Dental Management Consultants and is currently vice president, president elect of the organization. Deborah was the first recipient of the Academy of Dental Management Consultants uh, Emeritus Service Award. Deborah is also a member of the American Academy of Dental Practice Administration. She also serves on the Practice and Management Advisory Board for the American Dental Association. Deborah has been listed in Dentistry Today as a leader in continuing dental education and dental consulting for the past 15 years. In 2008, she was awarded the American Dental Assistance Association's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award. She was also named as one of the top 25 women in dentistry in 2014. That was in Dental Products Report? Yep. Um, Deborah is the 2015 recipient of the Gordon Christian Outstanding Lecture Award. And uh, and really, you've been an absolute idol of mine uh, since 1987. So this this is um, I want you to address this. I've always noticed that the dentists that are the most successful, you know, after 20, 30, 40 years, they always have consultants come in their office. They're always taken to the next level, and and they do that just to just to get you know three or four percent better each time it happens. And then the dentists who just desperately need it where you could just turn their whole life around, they never raise their hand for help. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. I always say, you know, when I work with clients, when I start working with clients or talking to potential clients, you know, I always say the, the dentist who can afford me the least is the one who needs me the most. Um, and it's that one of those in, in investments. Um, I think and, the guy... And, and all, all the millionaires... They always have made these investments in consultants. Over, you know, every every decade they they've had probably two. They probably had two a decade, and four de- and it, they just build it up. But then the dentist won't do that. But they'll go buy a hundred thousand dollar Cerac machine or a hundred thousand dollar CBCT or a seventy five thousand dollar laser. And I'm like, dude, that's not the issue. The well, issue is you don't understand the business. And, you know, it's funny because here's what I, you know, I actually had a client who was building a brand new practice, brand new doctor, and he's, he, and actually he's a major townie, so I won't mention his name because he is on your site all the time. And I said, why did you buy, I mean, he, he couldn't equip all operatories, he equipped two, and I said, wait a minute, you could have equipped a third operatory instead of buying this Cirac machine. Why did you buy this Cirac machine? And he says, well, because the guy sold it to me. I said, Call him and, and send it back. You need a third operatory. You don't need a CAD cam right now. You don't even have a patient yet scheduled. Um, I think they think technology is is the answer. And and it's if when I first even when I met Ross, twenty actually we're celebrating our twentieth anniversary. So twenty seven years ago, I said you know it's one thing to know how to do the dentistry. It's another thing to know how to talk to patients to get them to say yes. So you get a lot of dentists who are frustrated because they say, well, I know how to do this, but patient's insurance won't cover it, or patient isn't interested, or the patient has a low dental IQ. And Howard, I don't know about you, but I have never seen a dental IQ test ever. I don't know how you measure that. And um, I say, you know, it's, it's really one thing to know how to do it, but it's another thing to know how to talk about it and how to get the patients to say yes to it. And a machine isn't going to do that for you. You're going to have to learn. Those are soft skills. Those are soft skills. In fact, I just was talking, I did a program for 3M, and uh, they were all talking about the technology, and they've got great technology. You know, 3M uh, used to have the, low, the, the tagline, 3M um, Innovation. Now they've changed their tagline. It was very smart. So now it's called 3M, Science Brought to Life. And that really, Howard, think about it. That's what dentistry is. It is science brought to life. So when I spoke for 3M, and they were all talking about all the technology and all the 
things that it could do. I said, you know what? I'm the one who's going to bring science to life because I'm going to teach you now that you have this equipment, how are you going to talk to the patients about it? Why does it make you better? Why should the patient pay more? Why should the patient choose you because of, of this equipment? So you better learn how to talk about it before you buy it. Or once you buy it, you better figure out how you're going to pre present it to make it work for you. I have a client that, that um, uh, you would die when you hear us. He gets, he's got a great Google presence. He gets 135 new patients from Google. So I'm in his office and his schedule is light and he's actually hired me to come in and teach scheduling. I said, wait a minute. Um, I said, this is great. I'm looking at the schedule and I see that he's accepting Medicaid patients. I said, you know, that is really great that you're giving back to the community to, cause a lot of, not, a lot, a lot of, there are not a lot of dentists who will take Medicaid. And the team says, oh, we're doing, we're taking Medicaid patients to fill our schedule. I said, wait a minute, you get 135 new patients a month and you're taking Medicaid to fill your schedule and you have a CIRAC machine. So what's wrong here? What's going on here? And it's those soft teaching skills. So he's got this great CIRAC machine. And I said, you know what you really need to do? I, I said, you need to create a CIRAC lounge and you need to really market that. And why, why, hello kitty. <laughs> So why would uh, either the, either that's your tail or that's somebody else's tail? I, I so, finally got a wig. Yeah, <laughs> it's about time. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> um, so so I think it's it, for me technology is great if you know how to apply it again to the soft skills of customer service. So you said a client of yours. So um, explain that. So if they go to your website www.deborahinglehartnash and I'm going to spell that because. Deborah, D E B R A, Engelhart, E N G E L H A R D T, and then Nash. Um, um, what, what is the client of yours? Well, how much does that cost? What do you do? Um, t t tell, tell them what you do. Well, great question. Uh, and I appreciate you asking me about that. I'm probably a little bit different than um, a lot of uh, consultants and a lot of consultants who work for major companies. I'm, I used to be. Um, a pride consultant. Most people know that way back in the day. Um, and uh, I am independent. I don't have anybody who works with me and I charge by the day. I don't, I don't have the, uh, I don't have my client sign a contract because my belief has always been that I um, have a responsibility to earn my way back in. If I, if I don't create change, if I, if my uh, client doesn't see value in uh, retaining me, um, they don't have to go through any kind of um, mechanics or any kind of laborious getting out of a contract. So I work on a daily basis. I typically go in and do a practice assessment, although some people will say, Deborah, would you come in and do a communications workshop? I mean, I'm pretty much known for how to talk to people, how to talk to patients, how to get them to say yes, how to help them understand office protocols, office standards. Uh, so sometimes they'll say, would you come in and do a workshop? Um, for my team, would you come in and get our team get our get us started for the new year? I'm doing a lot of 2016 uh, jump starts for people, so I charge by the day. Um, I what, what is your out. what is your daily charge? Um, Thirty five hundred dollars plus expenses. Thirty five hundred plus expenses, and I can I can tell you that knowing Deborah since eighty seven, I I can list a hundred dentists that uh, adore you and worship you and think you're. Yeah. I, I can't. I mean, I mean, you're you're a legend. It goes without saying. Um, but when you go into a typical office, you know, my my job and the reason I'm so glad you got on here. I, I just want to help my homies. You know, they're. they're I, know. I I've been here in Phoenix, and every year since '87, every year one to three dentists kill themselves. I mean, just in my town. When I mean my town, you know, the Phoenix Metro, Mesa, yeah. Tempe, Chandler. But um, so the, they they just get so stressed, and I just want them to get um, I just want them to get help and have a happier, healthy practice. So talk to these thousands of dentists who are all individuals in their car, commuting to work. What are low, I, I want, I'm trying to set up the scenario. Picture the low hanging fruit, the red flags of what's going on in their office that shouldn't be that way and how you could help. What, what are you, you know, seeing when you go into offices? I mean, what is the that biggest That's a great problem? question. And you know, and for those, for the low hanging and the guys and the ladies who are are feeling a level of desperation one of the one of the best things they could do one of the first things they could do is reveal themselves to their team and sit down with their team and say help me or i need your help and it's amazing when you ask the team um and, and you let them know that i i need your help 
here's what's going on and and have a very passionate subjective conversation with the team and empower the team to um, and then obviously then provide them skills but empower the team to say listen we're in this together and, and i need you i i really need you here's where i am whether it be a feeling of desperation or frustration or aggravation to sit down with the team and talk about it um so but, but, I, if, I, I, but if i ask if i asked um if i'm sitting next to someone on a plane and I said, you know, give me five words that describe a doctor. It's never going to be humble, raising my hand, ask for help, um, you know, desperation. It's always going to be arrogant, cocky, conceited, know-it-all. Isn't that sad? Yeah. I mean, they, they, they – so, 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 so you're talking to these people that um, are just trained. I mean, like, you know, an undergrad that, you know, you got to beat out all the other people. So you get in dental school and they don't, and then you get in dental school. They're, they're, they're just bred to be first in the class, first in everything. So that natural selection, they're usually not the humble type to raise their hand and say, say to their staff, man, I'm in over my head. I know how to do a crown, but you know, what, what is going on with recall? Why is my overhead so high? How come I don't have $3,000 tomorrow for payroll? So, so how do you, how do you get an arrogant know-it-all doctor to raise their hand and be humble and say, hey, I, I, I wasn't trained for this. I mean, I, I'm kind of in over my head. You know, I think that um, I always I tell a story. I won't, I won't go into the whole story, but um, I will never forget when uh, a dentist or a, a, a doctor got down on one knee to me, not to propose. He got down on one knee. It, I was having some medical issues, and he put his hand on my arm, and he said, I know how much faith and trust you had with your other doctor. I had moved, I'd relocated, and he said, I'm going to do my best to earn your faith and trust. And when you, I think when, when the dentist learns to, to step down and look the patient in the eye and say, um, I, I'm going to, I want to earn your trust. I want to earn your faith. Um, first of all, it's a great demonstration to the team. Wow. This guy or this woman has uh, great humility. I mean, what question I would ask the doctor, what would you, what do you want your team to say about you to patients? Is he, he's an arrogant SOB. I hate working here, but it's a paycheck. And um, he comes in um, with a chip on his shoulder every day because your team is, is your, is your front man. And you know, what, what I have the opportunity to say to patients when they call, I'll say, not only is my employer, my, not only is the doctor a gifted artist and a great clinician, but you are going to love his chairside manner. He is affable. He is humble. He's an amazing listener. Those are the skills that the patients want to hear about. They want to hear, I mean, you can say he's a great clinician and he is a, you know, amazing technical skills, works with the best laboratories, uses the best materials, but there's more. And what you're going to really love about this person is, um, it, it, it is her chairside manner. Um, you know, 80% of the reasons why patients choose uh, dentistry is based on relationship. It has nothing to do with technical skills. How would you know this? Most doc, you know, most patients don't, don't come in and say, hey, I'd like to see some cases. And I'd like to see the tertiary anatomy of the doctor's work. I'd like to see some margins. And I want to see some impressions to see how, how, um, how his margins are, how his impressions are. Most of them um, are choosing based on relationship. And if you really think about it, they haven't even met the doctor, like in the first 10 minutes of coming into the practice, so the first phone call, they haven't even met the doctor yet. So they're already starting to make choices um, of, have I chosen the right place? So I've got to have a team that understands and appreciates um, what it is the doctor can offer, and they are really the ones that are getting the patients to say, yeah, I've chosen the right practice. And then the, the doctor has to, you know, they have to live out, if, uh, they have to pr deliver what the team promises um, uh, so now when the patient walks in and meets the doctor, the whole, now the whole purpose is to validate that the patient made the right decision. I mean, think about it. The day the patient picks up the telephone, they chose your office. They've decided to choose you for their care. Now the responsibility becomes to validate the decision every step of the way. Um, do, patients don't want to work with arrogance. They just, they just don't, they want to work with people that they like. I love the way you said the staff is the front man because it reminds me of one of my favorite movies of all time, 10 Feet from Stardom. Did you see that movie? No. Well, no. We, we grew up in the 70s, and um, they gave this, um, this woman a, um, uh, an, an, what is it, an Oscar? Uh, not an Oscar, the Music Hall of Fame. 
And this, uh, this, this woman got in the Music Hall of Fame, and he's like, well, who is she? She didn't even have a record. Turns out that in the 70s, the um, people who you would think were arrogant and cocky, like Mick Jagger and Bruce Springsteen and, and David Bowie, um, they would allow the backup singers just to take over. And there was this one backup singer, and she said that when she went to the low self-esteem people, you know, they'd say, well, you're singing too loud and sing from the sheet, and that's not what you wrote. And then she she went to like like Mick Jagger and she, and she just started letting it rip. Mick would actually back up from the microphone, basically saying, "Just take it away." And yeah. if you look back at the the greatest musicians there, they were giving their backup singers full range. You know, innovate, don't read a sheet, just take over the whole show. And and I see that with Dennis too. The ones that let their assistant and their hygienist just take over the show and just just stand up and just let it all out they're they're the they're the rolling stones absolutely and the ones who try to confine them to just read the sheet music and don't sing louder than me and and be a backup singer those people were one hit wonders well and that's also those are the team members who say to patients well i'm sorry but that's our policy and they're they're they will not think out of the box because they're afraid to because they're afraid if if i veer from the standard quote policy then i'm going to get in trouble so, you know, you've got to, I will, um, I will never forget my old uh, mentor was Phil Whitener. And you and I remember Dr. Phil Whitener from way back in the day. And he used to say that, you know, we really should be operating from a position of a stainless steel ball encased in velvet. That we've got, you know, we've got some, some values, some core values. We've got some, uh, some boundaries, but there's flexibility. And I think if, when doctors are too rigid, um, it's, and it's usually, then, it, then there's no room for flexibility. So the team can't be creative and the, key, the team has a hard time um, being themselves. And you know what? Patients want to see real people when they come to the office. I mean, they are already um, a little, possibly a little bit um, nervous. They could be cautious. They could have had some previous bad dental experiences. They want to see real people. They want to work with real people. Uh, they, I mean, that's, that's pretty critical. You know, you had mentioned earlier, and I wanted to, to address that. You talked about, you know, the sort of the, the leading doctors who always hire consultants. And I, I think one of the reasons for that is that, um, and I heard this just this past weekend, those doctors realize that, you know, when you're streamlining and you're moving, moving really well, and, you know, it's almost like weight loss. You know, it's harder to lose the last five pounds than the first 15 or the first 20. So those doctors who are, are looking at only having five pounds to lose realize that's really harder than um, starting from them having to lose 50 or 20. You can lose 20 pounds, the first 20 pounds, easy. The last five are tough. That's why you have to hire a consultant, you know, to say, what are we doing to grow? I mean, you're looking at these doctors who are maybe listening to this are looking at the end of 2015. What are you going to do for 2016 to be better? That's got it. That should be the should have been the big question in November for these doctors. What are you going to do to make 2016 look better than 2015? Because it can't look the same. It can't look the same because it's not going to be better. It's not going to grow. Well, so they you, they they already, they already have a plan. They're going to buy a laser. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They always want to buy. They always, want to, buy, to, they always yeah. want to buy a shiny object. They always yeah. know that that when they're feeling despair and they're feeling overwhelmed, they always have. Two things, only two levers. They either buy a shiny object like a CAD cam, a CBC, a laser, whatever, or they're going to go to an institute, whether it be Panky or LVI or Scottsdale or John Quays or whatever, and if they just learned how to treat the worn dentition, all their problems will go away. And so you got to talk to them. Or, you or they're going to buy a marketing. They're going to buy a marketing. Uh, they're going to buy some marketing. They're going to go into social media. They're going to buy. Someone's going to get them new patients. Somebody's going to uh, attract new patients to them, and that's going to change. And here's what I say. You know, it's one thing to attract new patients, but if you don't change your behavior, you're not going to keep new patients. If you, you know, if it's and it's not going to help you improve. And my question always is, is as a consultant, is before you start rushing in thinking you need more new patients. First of all, there are a couple numbers you need to know, but what are you doing with the ones you already have? And, and really the first thing to do is say, um, what is our treatment acceptance rate? I mean, we may get a whole lot of patients, but what are we actually doing with them once they get here? And before we start attracting new patients, let's figure out our treatment acceptance rate and what is our average value for patients. 
and let's figure out what we're doing with recare patients. When was the last time we really sat down and re-engaged a, a, a patient of record back into treatment that was diagnosed for the last 5, 10, possibly even 15 years? And sometimes we develop a, almost an attitude of apathy. They're not interested. They don't have the right IQ. They can't afford it. Their insurance won't pay for it. We've told them 15 times they're not going to do it. Well, then how are you going to change your behavior to, to change their behavior? See, that's the big question. Gee, we really want to change our patient's behavior. We really want to change their attitude or their, their dependence on insurance. So the question isn't how are you going to change their behavior or not, not adopting an, an attitude of, well, our patients are all insurance-driven or they're stupid or they're, they live in the wrong neighborhood. What are we going to do? To, how are we going to change our behavior to then in turn change our patient's behavior. So it, it goes back internally. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna attract a different kind of person. We're gonna attract the same people. What are we gonna do inside our, of our practice to change our behavior that's gonna change our patient's behavior to get them to move forward with our care? So mm -hmm. it goes back to being, in, you know, what are you gonna do on the inside? And that's less expensive than buying the shiny machine. So what do, you, what do you do when you go into these? What, what, what are the most common problems that you see when you go in and you fix? Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the dentist listening to this, um, I, I don't think a lot of them even know what the problems are. I really do. I, I, I think when it comes to their, the business of dentistry, they're always somewhere between Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. They're, they're blind all the way to dead. They're, they're, just, they're so obsessed in finding that fourth canal in MB2 that they have no idea what the hell is going on in the business. So can you try to describe red flags uh, that these problems exist? Because and, and you see this in seminars. I've seen it when you were lecturing where you will say something, the dentist will look at you like a deer in a headlight while the staff's all laughing and tapping them on the arm. And, and if the staff wasn't there hitting them on the arm, that dentist listening to you wouldn't even think, well, that doesn't happen in my office. But this whole yeah. staff, the whole row's looking at them like, hello, hello. <laughs> So, 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 so now you're talking to a dentist all by themselves. She's commuting to work. How, what, what problems are there that you don't even think she's aware of that you could fix and make her life easier? Uh, great question. Uh, and actually it's a lot of times in my seminars, the doctor says, you go to the seminar and you hear practice management. I'm going to go learn, you know, pathways to the pulp. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. one of the other issues. Um, I think one of the situations is I think doctors, um, are not subjective enough about their practice. They don't, they don't really know. They know what they want. They're afraid to tell the team what they want. They're they give a lot of power away. You know, the, the doctors will say, well, I'd really love to be, I'd really like my practice to be this. Um, and so they go to the team and say, you know, what do you think about what, whatever that be, insurance-free or doing more cosmetic aesthetics or bringing in an associate, whatever it may be. And the team will say, oh, no, doctor, we can't do that. I'm so sorry, we can't do that, doctor. Our patients are different. Our practice is different. No, our patients will never, will never like that. So doctor, you know, kind of goes back into his little office and, uh, and says, okay, well, my team says we can't do that. So I think the strong doctors, the strong leaders, the successful doctors are the doctors who say, this is what I want. And it's, oh, it almost becomes, it's an executive decision. I think doctors need to be more executives, CEOs of their, of their practice as opposed to an employee of the practice. Um, I would say, doctor, you have, the, you have the power. Use the power to good, not evil. Tell this, tell, say to the team, this is what I want. There are no, this is, there's no deviation. Now, we're not going to spend our time talking about how it will or will not work. We're going to spend our time talking about how to make it work. So I think that one of the situations I see many times is doctors try and be objective about their practice. Now, you know how much time it took you to go to dental school. It, you know how much it costs you to go to dental school and how much it costs you to run a practice, in, in not only in financially but in heart, muscle, and stomach lining. And and so then I, it's, I think it's ridiculous for the doctor to say, well, I'm going to be objective and I'm going to think objectively about your practice. And I turn around, I go in and say, I don't want you to think objectively about your practice. I want you to be totally subjective. I want you to be totally passionate, totally committed, because that's what moves people. That's what drives people. That's what moves your team. That's what moves your patients. That's what makes you become a role model. I mean, if you think about the leaders and you're, you're talking about, you know, those doctors who stand out. You know, people say, well, if I could only be like 
him or her. Well, what makes them different? What makes a leader different? It's their passion. It's their commitment. It's their strength of conviction. So sometimes I just want to slap a doctor around and say, be, have a stronger conviction and tell your team what you want. And then we'll train them to, to do that, what you want, as opposed to going in kind of, and I say this lovingly, um, and I'm not meaning to make any denigrating or disparaging remarks, but sometimes I'll say, doctor, stand up for your practice to your team and say, this is what I want. And we're not gonna we're not gonna debate whether or not it's gonna be that way. We're gonna talk about how we're gonna make that happen. And explain so, you're using the word objective, subjective. Explain the difference in objective, subjective. Those subjective two words. means I so uh, subjective is very emotional. I have an emotional tie. Uh, I have an emotional feeling about something. Objective means um, it's black and white. It's the difference between. Um, uh, I always say, you know, a the doctor is subjective, which means he or she is very emotional about his or her practice. Objective is the person who's running the numbers. It's your book, it's your accountant that you send the numbers to, your CPA, and they're managing your practice based, based on numbers. That's a very objective look. It's a black and white okay. look, no emotions involved. I want, I want to ask, uh, good idea or bad idea? Um, I'm a dentist. I just want to, you know, you said Pathways of the Paul. I almost laugh because that is my favorite book by Stephen Cohen. I mean, it's like seventh edition. I, I call that book Dental Porn. I mean, it really is a great book. And I only want to read Stephen Cohen's, you know, Pathways of the Paul. I don't want to do any of this stuff. So I'm going to hire an office manager or make my wife do it and just delete it. They'll do that, and I'm just going to do dentistry. Good idea or bad idea? Good idea. As long as you hire the right person. And you got to check in with that person. And you, but you know, you know, you, you, I, I've got some. I have a doctor, um, a client in uh, uh, in in the Boston area, and he basically took his oldest member, his his longest term member um, employee, and he made her office manager. And I said, what are her office manager? What are her skills? What skills has she has, has she possessed or has she demonstrated that she is an office manager? And he says, well, she's just been with me for 15 years. I trust her. Doesn't make her. Doesn't mean she's a good office manager. Doesn't make her a good administrator, because sometimes um, and and you really have to train that administrator, office manager, that objective person to say, listen, here's your role. This is a totally. You're not simply another team member because you have to kind of you have to be you have to learn to be a bad cop. So here's one of the 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 analogies that I use that a, a good a a good relationship between administrator and doctor. It's almost like the pediatrician. Remember when your kids were small and you took your, your, you took your kids to the pediatrician? What, what would the pediatrician do when it was time to give the shot? Have the nurse do it. At, walk out of the room and have the nurse do it. Guess what? That's the, the that's relationship between the dentist and the administrator office manager. When it's time to deliver the shot, the, the, you know, the, the, the structure, um, the, the office protocols, um, those things. It's it's the administrator who does that. Doctors should always be able to be good cop, um, and the administrator is bad cop. The administrator is the one who delivers the information to put the resources into action. What percent of the million dollar practices where the dentist is taking home two fifty, three fifty, four hundred? What percent of them have an office manager versus not, and they do it themselves? Um, I would probably say 70%, 70, 75% of them have somebody who's in that role. And what, and if you were this dentist and you're sitting here saying, okay, I'm only, it seems like most fans of my show have been out of school five years. I mean, there's several thousand and most of them are, uh, um, saying they're listening to this, uh, in the back row of dental school, uh, all the way to like five years out. And, um, so, so she's got this office and she's got two assistants. She's got a hygienist, she's got a receptionist. And she's overwhelmed trying to learn how to do clinical dentistry. And she, she, she wants to develop an office manager. What traits would this person have and what training would you give her? Well, first of all, they have to be bondable. So that's a big question. Can, you know, I mean, anybody, in fact, anybody handling money, money in the office has to be, be able to be bonded. So that would be the first, the first thing. They've got to be somebody who could be bonded. They have to have some, it has to be somebody who knows that they've got to step out of being um, the friend of the practice. So they've, they've got to have, um, they've got to have some strength of conviction uh, uh, in terms of uh, the other, in terms of 
um, being able to step away and not be the friend. They have, they can't be somebody who's everybody's friend. So we're not looking for a mom. This is not a mom um, who's, you know, everybody's you know, going to be the, the matriarch of the practice. So it has to be um, somebody who's willing to take some classes, who's willing to take some programs, some leadership training programs. Um, I think that's, that's pretty critical. I would actually probably do a DISC profile or some sort of personality profile, whether it be DISC or Myers-Briggs or something. I would do a DISC profile um, on this person to see if this person has those innate skills um, to make them um, a, strong, uh, a strong advocate. Um, so that would be important for me as well. I would also ask, I would interview them as a manager, not as an employee. So if I, just because the person's at the front desk doesn't make them the office manager. So I would, I would have um, interview questions. I want to also go back to, and I can certainly supply those, but I would want to go back to two you, you said about the wife. And, you know, I do a course called For Better or Work, you know, uh, working with spouses. One of the problems that you have with asking the spouse to be the manager they are also going to be very subjective about the practice. By gosh, especially if I'm a young family, say I'm a husband and wife, young family, the wife is the dentist, and everything they have is invested in this business, in this practice. Um, so how can I walk into, into the dental office and be an objective manager and look at the numbers objectively? Um, they're going to need a mentor. They're going to need a coach. They're going to need, if, if a husband and wife are going to work together, they are definitely going to need an outside objective coach to help them, to guide them. And that, that's what I did clear back in the day. I mean, when I got to school in 87, I said, okay, I'm 24 years old. What could I know? So I, I took my house manager. We got an in-office consultant. And then what was great is why I was running around the country getting my FAGD and MAGD and all this stuff like that. Um, she was always on the phone with her and going to more training with the consultant. And so she had a mentor. Uh, what, what do you think of that new um, uh, American Academy Dental Office Manager? They have a fellowship program. Do you think that's uh, a good training system? You know, um, I don't know enough about that fellowship. I mean, I know about ADOM. Um, I'm very aware of, of ADOM. Uh, I don't know enough about what they teach and what, what the fellowship is. So I'm not, I, I can't speak to it. I don't know if it means that I've just, I've served a certain amount of time and I've been around a certain amount. Um, I do believe that there is a, um, uh, I believe there's a, t a practicum that they have to take or a test that they have to take to earn their fellowship, which is not a bad thing, not a bad thing. Now, um, and, and how awesome for the doctor and the team member to invest the time and the money in participating in any kind of program like that. So, so, so um, give, talk about what you're uh, fixing when you're going to office these days. What, what, what are common problems that you're seeing that you're working on uh, that's making it uh, the dental office uh, smoother? Uh, lack of communication skills. I also want to go back and say, you know, Ross and I, uh, we work together, and here I'm a consultant, and he's a speaker, and, and um, you know, we have a teaching institute and all that, and we still also have a coach that we work with together. So, what, what, I mean, what's, what's Ross's teaching institute website? Uh, it's www, the Nash Institute. The Nash Institute? The Nash Institute. Yeah. The I mean, N-A-S-H Institute. N -A -S uh-huh. But we also, we not only teach clinical application, and it's interesting because you were talking about all these classes, that for every clinical course that we teach, there's always a practice management portion that now you know how to do this, here's how you apply it back in your practice. So we always do practice management in conjunction with our clinical teachings, in addition to our dental business school and our live patient, but we always do clinical. But let's go back. To, so. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we do clinical. We do dental business school. We well, also have a life. Dental business school. Is that a different website than Deborah Englehart Nash .com? No, it's well, it's part of the Nash Institute. I do a two-day dental business school four times a year in, in throughout through the Nash Institute. So it's you kind of, so four times a year you give a two-day dental business. What is it called? Dental business school. Dental business school. Down and dirty. Absolutely. That's what it's called. Yeah. Down and dirty. It should be. <laughs> but what is it called? Say it again. Dental. It's dental business school. Dental it's business too... school. Yep. You know what I think the best marketing thing that um, you should do? Um, I've seen this so many times on Dental Town. When you have a, um, a two-day program, so it's two, what is it, two six-hour lectures or, or two, eight? Two eight hours. It's 14 hours. So it's 14 hours. Um, yep. You know, when a dentist, dentists are cynical. They really are cynical people. They're, they're controlling. They don't like to delegate. Um, when they see a flyer or an ad 
for a two-day course. And they're just like, it, it's too big of a leap to go from a, a, a flyer to I'm going to fly to, what is it, South Carolina, North Carolina? North. Huntersville, yep. North Carolina. What is that, a suburb of Charlotte? Yep. Um, so it, it's so great of a leap to go from a flyer to flying to Charlotte and spend two days on a course. I think you should take um, an hour, the, the first hour of that, and make an online dental course on Dentaltown. We put up 350 courses, and they've been viewed over half a million times. Uh, we, we're, we're over 205,000 uh, dentists registered, 40,000 of them downloaded the app. And I think if you put a teaser and they got for low commitment, no money, they, they don't have to fly to see you, and they could see you, they, they'd fall in love with you and Ross and, and they would, and you would, you would earn them after an hour or two. And then they'd say, you know what? I I'd want be, more of this. I'd be happy to do that. Absolutely happy to do that. And it would be a, it would really be an honor to our, our CE uh, uh, list of speakers uh, to have you on there. Um, is this something for dental business school? Is this something that the dentist should go by himself? Is it something they should take their spouse, office manager, whole staff? What, who, who needs, we, yeah, to, who never needs had, to be educated on the business? We have, um, we've had, uh, it's best when the entire team uh, attends. Um, again, we we're talking about this. Most of the time the doctor will say, listen, I'm sending my entire team except with, with the exception of me um, and you all go. Uh, well, we've had anywhere from an office manager who will attend we actually we have we've had office administrators of multiple locations who will come almost test the waters they come and take the class and then they send other team members to the next sessions so we've had um whole teams come we've had single administrators come office managers come doctor our team come without the doctors so but what do you recommend for a turnaround when, when when a dentist is stressed and overall and see that's another reason i think they like clinical institutes because they get a fly out of their town. Now, you know, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed in their office. They're not happy. They're stressed financially. They have interpersonal dilemmas where sometimes they want to, you know, scream at one of their staff members or whatever. And it's just so nice to just go to the airport, fly the hell out, and learn about occlusion for three days because um, there's no patients and no staff. And then they, they fly back. So if a dentist feels that way, um, should they send their staff or should they be a part of it too? Should they all learn together? I mean, what, what's, what's the well, best? Well, for Howard, the ship first around. of all, what is the bis biggest expense in any dental practice? What is the most, the highest labor? What, what's big? Labor. labor. So why wouldn't you spend, why wouldn't you do devote some time to your biggest cost to, to, to shore up and to, to enhance the skills of the, of, of your biggest expense, your labor costs. So uh, my feeling is, um, I, the investment in labor should be like one of the biggest investments you would make. It's your biggest cost. It's your, it, it's, it's the, it's the thing that's going to, it's really going to, it's going to be what is going to make your practice different. It is not going to be the fancy machine. Those people who work for you are really what makes your practice different. So my recommendation is your, your office is going to be closed anyway. They're, it's held on a Friday, Saturday. Come and be with your team and learn with your team. You're actually also saying to the team, this is what you're saying to the team. You're making it, you're demonstrating to the team, this is important enough for all of us to attend. And you are important enough, team members, for me to invest in you, not only in the money, but my, I'm investing myself in you. So, uh, you know, I always say to this, tell people about our office and our practice, when we sit down with team members and I sit down with a prospective employee, it's real simple. I say, I'm going to tell you, there's only three things you need to know if you're going to work here. Number one, we hire grownups. I don't want to babysit. I don't want to have to tell you to put your cell phone in your cell, in your lockers. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't micromanage. I, I don't have, we don't have time to do that. So um, we hire grownups. Number two, keep your knees bent. We're going to be about change. We're going to be about new technology, new materials, new protocols. Keep your knees bent and you, you will get what you give. So I will say to the doctor, if you, your, if you want your team to invest in the practice, you need to invest in your team. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, and it's a, it's a great demonstration to your team to say this material matters. The other thing that the reason for attending is they actually sit down and work. It's not just all about listening. They sit down with their own big flip charts and they are creating action plans and they're, they're sitting down and saying, okay, what are the problems in our office? So it's very specific. It's not generalized. So it's specific to that particular, to that practice. What are their problems in their office? And we fix it while they're here. So it's two days of, you know, of not simply generic and how will this apply. It's 
what are you going to do about this information in your own practice? So how does a team do that if they're saying, well, we've got some great ideas, but we don't have a doctor here to sanction it? So now they're going to go back home to the team and say, oh, my gosh, it was a great weekend and we learned so much. And now we have a bunch of changes we want to make. And now the doctor's going to say, we'll schedule a staff meeting in 2017 and we'll talk about it. So um, one of the biggest frustrations is um, how long does it take to make to make a change? And some people say, well, we'll wait till the schedule gets lighter or we'll wait till the moon is in the seventh house and Earth aligns with Mars. And it it only takes a moment to make a change. It, uh, you don't have to wait for the perfect moment to change something. So uh, the doctor needs to be a part of that change to make it happen. Because okay. I'm going to turn to okay, the doctor she, and say, are we going to do this? She's driving to work right now. What are red flags that the, the staff is dysfunctional, that the staff is not running smoothly? What, what, what are things she would notice about the staff if, it, if um, the staff wasn't Team Harmony getting along you know, we're working well. Um, I would I would take a look at a couple of things. I would take a look at treatment acceptance rate. I would take a look at. I mean, are our patients saying yes to treatment? Are, are the are is the team vested in getting the patient? So it's, not, it's one thing to bring them in. It's another thing to keep them there and to get them to say yes. So okay, the I the, would take, the, the insurance the insurance companies say that um, for every hundred cavities diagnosed, thirty eight percent are drilled, filled, or billed. So would, if you were 38 percent, is that good? What would you, what kind of treatment acceptance rate would you well, think they should? Well, that's a great question because you know I, I'm not a believer of, of being. A, you're not going to get 100 uh, percent treatment acceptance rate all the time. But I'm saying if an office is is doing, it's got to do a better than the 38 percent for gosh sakes. So I'm looking at 70 to 75 percent treatment acceptance rate minimum. So so three out of four. So so 75 percent. So, yeah, so, 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 so make the connection. So, um, if you're not having 75% treatment plan acceptance rates, uh, so then you're saying that the, who's ever presenting the treatment is not trained adequately. Yeah. Not, not trained adequately. Or, or they're saying things like, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I mean, I, I go into offices sometimes and I'll say, are you tracking your treatment acceptance rate? And they'll say, how do you do that? Which tells me what you're not tracking your treatment acceptance rate. I don't care how many new patients you get. I want to know what you're doing with them once you, once you got them in there. Um, I, the other thing I want to take a look at is recall return rate. What is your recall return rate? How, I mean, some doctors will say, oh, you know, I get 100% of, of uh, my patients coming back. No, you don't. You don't. So you got to do some math and you got to figure out what is my recall return rate? What percentage of my patients of record are coming back in consistently? And it should be um, 80 to 85%. I mean, you're not going to, again, you're going to have a 5% attrition per year. You're not going to keep 100%. But the other piece of, of that, that I want to take a look at, especially in hygiene, is what percentage of patients of record are committing themselves to additional treatment? So what additional treatment is being diagnosed out of hygiene? That, to me, is huge. When I'm assessing hygiene, I want to take a look at what additional treatment is being presented and accepted out of hygiene. It's not, for me, it's more than, I mean, I know there's some consultants who say, oh, hygiene's a lost leader. You don't have to worry about that. You need to worry about, you know, new patients coming in. I'll say, wait a minute. You got an office with 1,600 patients of record. I know there's treatment that was um, diagnosed that wasn't completed, not accepted yet. What are you doing with those people? So that reduces your necessity for a lot of new patients. What so so? One of the questions should be, or one of the statistics that should be monitored: What additional treatment is being diagnosed out of hygiene? I've had some hygienists say um, when I've gone in and we've talked about that, and they'll say, "That's not my job. My job's to clean teeth. That's all." I, I'm, I'm, or they'll say this: They'll say, "Here's one of the problems. You know, we've done this accelerated hygiene program, and the doctor only gives me 15 minutes with a patient. How am I supposed to quote present dentistry when I only have 15 minutes?" And you know what? They're right. So we got to come up with a system or we have to come up with a protocol that that is um, that that happens all the time, that uh, um, that we are we are asking the right questions with patients. We're taking a look at existing treatment plans and we're not assuming, well, they're not interested. They don't care. I don't have time. Their insurance will pay for it. We've got to come up with a with a skill level, a skill training, on how you reintroduce existing treatment to patients to get them to, to, to say yes. And, you know, what are the questions that you ask? What are the statements that you make? And, and those are training, those are skills that the team should be trained on. And if a, if a team member resists, 
and says, well, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Or um, then they're probably not the right, the right team member. Also, um, there's two questions that we, we have to make sure that we cover. Two questions you can ask. I mean, every, do every doctor should be able to walk into his, in, into his or her practice and ask these two questions about every system in the office. Number one is what we're doing good for the patients. Are we doing, what we're doing is good, is it good for the patient? Is our scheduling system good for the patient? Is our financial protocol good for the patient? Um, are our, is our new patient experience good for the patient? And that's one of the first questions. The second question is this, is it good for the practice? Is the system good for the practice? It has to, you have to be able to, sit, to answer yes to both questions. It's good for the patient and good for the practice. It's probably the right thing to do. If you have to answer no to one of them, it's going to falter and, and it's going to fail. So that's a, you know, you could go back, through, uh, a doctor um, can go back through his or her whole practice and say, okay, let me take a look at all the systems. And they could even do that with personnel. Let me take a look at my employees. Is this employee good for the patient? Um, okay, are they good for the practice? I mean, you may have a, a great producing hygienist um, or care site or whatever, I'm not picking on hygiene, but if they, if they cause um, team dissension, if they are a chronic problem, then you have to ask yourself, is, it, is this person good for the practice? They're not, they're not good for the practice then. So on your website, DeborahEnglehart.Nash, what, what are you talking about when you talk about the pre-operative appointment? Oh, my favorite thing. I thought um, Ross was your favorite thing. Well, he has a, a, my favorite thing, <laughs> but... <laughs> that he is my favorite thing um you know uh, one of the things that I, i'm a big big fan of there should be no reason why a practice isn't collecting 100 percent of their of, uh, of of what they produce there just isn't i mean there was the, the day when you and i first started in dentistry and we talked about um accounts, re accounts receivable over 90 days being a third thinking that was healthy there's just no reason anymore in today's world not to collect 100% of, of, um, of collections. But here's sometimes the dilemma. Um, patients scheduled for the big bridge prep, the big, you know, the big treatment plan, and they're supposed to be bringing in their initial payment at the day of the appointment. And they walk in, and here's the, oftentimes the dilemma. They walk in and say, was I supposed to pay today? Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, I didn't bring my checkbook. Oh, no, I don't want to use my credit card because I'm getting ready to go to Europe for three weeks. And no, I can't do that. And so now what do we do? Do we, do we prep and pray? Do we let them walk out? Do, and we should never ha have the doctor be involved. So there's one problem. Or we get to the office at 745. We listen to the answering machine and says, hi, this is Howard Ferran, and I'm so sorry that I can't come in today. And you're looking in at your big bridge prep, and you're thinking, dang, now what am I going to do? Or, um, you know, they cancel short notice. So, um, one of the solutions to this is you, you divorce the initial payment with the, day, with the, with the, the prep appointment. Um, think about this. And it's because, probably because I've had, most of people know that I've had brain surgery. I've had a couple surgeries. When you go in for surgery, when you go and you have a preoperative visit, and they talk, they do all your preoperative instructions. You know, you all, you have to sign your directive to physicians. They talk about what to wear, what, when to arrive. They do all those things. They discuss insurance. And I thought, why aren't we doing that in the dental office? We should, we are scheduling a preoperative visit for anybody who's getting ready to start major treatment. They come in for the preoperative appointment. Um, we go ahead and we gather what, uh, any additional diagnostic information we need to gather. We take all of the pictures we need to take. We need to take, if we need to take impressions and face bow and, um, and all that for provisionals, we do all that and we collect the fee, whether it be the initial fee or the partial fee, whatever that, the, that practice's protocol is, they, we collect the fee at that appointment. And for my clients that have um, implemented this process of a preoperative appointment prior to the big prep, you know what their cancellation no-show rate is for the day of the prep appointment? Like none, zero. Patients already committed. The financial situation is already out of the, out of the way. Patients already ready to go. And if for some reason on the day of the pre-op, the patient said, oh, I forgot I'm supposed to pay today. We have an opportunity to, to work that out be, before the day of the big prep. So we don't get, we never get caught um, uh, in hindsight. So my, most of my clients, they, 
they've sort of said for anybody who's going to have four um, indirect procedures or anything that's typically the equivalent of three to five thousand dollars or more, they will be scheduled for a preoperative visit. This isn't for the patient who's coming in for one crown or a couple of fillings. This is for somebody who's getting ready to, to initiate a, a, a major treatment plan. It, it's just, it works. And it also saves time on the day of the prep appointment. Because imagine, again, you've scheduled at 9 a.m. The You're supposed to be starting um, cutting at 9.15, and now we've got to delimit the front desk, and now it's 9.40, and we don't know what we're going to do yet. The patient hasn't, didn't bring the check. Now we're trying to go through care credit, or we're trying to work out a credit card situation. Now it's 9.45, and the doctor's in the back, and I know you would be going nuts. Like, why isn't my patient in the chair? Well, we've got some situations we need to fix first, and, you know, the patient starts asking questions that, is it, you know, can I go potty during my procedure? Am I going to be able to eat tonight? And all of those things should have been discussed at the preoperative appointment. So we save time, and anybody can do it in the office. It doesn't have to be the doctor. Anybody can do the preoperative appointment. I just can do it. Dental assistant can do it. Anybody can do it. It doesn't have to be in doctor's schedule. So now I've saved probably an hour of doctor's time um, per uh, appointment for, for starting the big preps because the preoperative is um, taken care of. It's funny how there's different cultures for different healthcare sectors within the same country of America, like mm -hmm. that, because in the cosmetic world of uh, um, breast implantation, facelifts, tummy tucks, all that, you have to, when you schedule, you have to pay for it when you schedule. And a lot of the top cosmetic doctors around the America, if you schedule for a tummy tuck and that tummy tuck is four grand, you have to pay the four grand to make the appointment. And if you don't show up for it, you don't get your four grand back. And yeah, I mean, that's just yeah. routine in the cosmetic surgery world. And you're saying do we start bringing this home to dentistry. Absolutely. That's I mean, I genius. thought about it because I thought about it because of going in for a preoperative appointment before my craniotomy and they, you know, and I had questions. And how, I had long, how long ago was that and how are you doing? Um, oh, it was four years ago. And um, I'm doing great. I am. It's grown back a little bit. I've had radiation twice and... Um, so it's doing, thanks for asking. It's doing great. I, you know, I use it as an excuse though for swearing. I said that I developed Tourette's as a result of my craniotomy, my brain surgery. But frankly, I've always sworn. It had nothing to do with the, my brain tumor. <laughs> I mean. I, I was always confused with swearing because my mom and dad took us to mass 100% <laughs> every morning our whole life. You know, I mean, every morning we got up, we went to mass. That was the first thing we did seven days a week from birth to 17. That's what we did. And they both cussed like sailors. So I never associated cussing with not being, you know, nice or religious. Or I whatever. know. I just, and sometimes I just it's saw them just as, the most appropriate thing to say sometimes. Oh, yeah. They're, they're always the best adjectives and yeah. adverbs. At uh, any rate. Yeah. So for I, I mean, and I, I sort of thought about this prep. The other reason I thought about it was a gazillion years ago when I was consulting with Ross before we were um, married, um, there was a dilemma at the front desk and the patient had walked in. She was supposed to have been paying for her treatment that day. And she got into this big question of why am I paying today? And how, what if I don't like it? Um, and we, I mean, we had some great answers, you know, what if I don't like it? Um, when I'm through, what's my recourse if I paid you in full? Well, now we're 930 and, you know, and he hasn't even taken his pictures yet. And he's always taken preoperative photographs before he starts. And, um, you know, they, Back then, um, the process was we got to take a face bow and we got to, you know, take impressions. I'm thinking, man, we could have saved so much time and we done this all before today. And that's when I, it was a, like 20 years ago, it was a light bulb. And it's and, just been so successful for my clients. And what, what, uh, what courses is uh, Ross teaching at the National um, that you uh, are getting a lot of positive? What are you getting the most feedback from where dentists are taking uh, one of his uh, clinical courses and going back to the office and it's having a return on investment, having well, a, an impact. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. Of course, this is the first year that, pardon me, that we have now, um, we're in that first, first year we've st started to do live patient. So we actually are going to do live patient this year. So a, doc, a, pa a doctor can bring a patient and do a patient uh, with Ross as a mentor. We've never done that before. But more and more patient, more and more doctors are really um, interested in direct restorations. They're seeing that this is an alternative when, you know, for affordability, that there are a lot of options for um, uh, direct restoration. So our direct restoration course is probably one of the most popular, more than indirect, I think. So, so what would you and Ross say as your business, he's clinical? Um, I, I get this question a lot. I, I just got out of school, Deborah. I'm $350,000 in debt, and I'm, I'm 
and I think in order for me to be successful, I have to buy a $150,000 Serac machine, a $100,000 3D CBCT x-ray machine, and a $75,000 laser. And I feel like I'm going to double my dental school debt with three shiny objects that I have to buy to be successful. What would you say to that young 30-year-old girl? Go to, go to a Dale Carnegie course or a sales course to learn how to be a salesman. Before you buy any of that, go to Dale Carnegie. Go to, um, a, go to a course to learn how to talk to people because you didn't learn it in dental school. So get some skills on. on so does, uh, does Ross think you can be a great clinical dentist without CAD CAM? Yes. He doesn't have one. He doesn't have one. And, and see, this is the one thing I've, I've noticed. That don't he doesn't you, have a scanner. But wouldn't you say the average doctor making 250, 350, 400 a year doesn't even do molar endo, place implants, have a CAD cam or a laser? Wouldn't yeah. you say most of the big dogs, they just go in there and do fillings and crowns and hygiene, but they get an A in their business. Would you, exactly. would you say that's true or false? I would say it's true. I would say, I, I would say it's true. And actually, you know, one of the statistics uh, reveals that um, as you know, that one out of four doctors will be sued for malpractice. And they say that the doctor who is an excellent communicator, poor clinician, will be sued far less than the doctor who is an excellent clinician, poor communicator. People don't sue the guys, the person that they love. Um, so it goes back to um, it's, it's um, clinical skills certainly certainly important but if i'm looking at a, a new doctor getting out of dentistry you need to learn how to talk to your patients you need to learn how to market uh your practice and not only that doesn't mean you're going to go out and buy a system and certainly social media is is critical but once you attract the patients into your office you got to get them to say yes and they're not going to i mean and you got to get them to say yes we are we are out of time we're at a minute one but i have to just ask you one overtime question because uh, you and Ross are married. He's a dentist. You're a consultant. You're the front office. Um, what advice would you say to the married couples that are listening to this podcast or commuting to work and the doctor, she's driving, the husband's sitting on the side. What advice would you give this young couple and, you know, um, so that they um, don't blow up their marriage um, trying to build their practice? Decide. Who's going to be the leader? Who's going to have uh, decide? Who's going to have final say? It's very clear to um, our employees who makes the executive decision, and I and it's him. It's it's him, and I will support the executive decision. Um, so you got to make a decision. You have to decide who is going to be the boss. The team needs to know that there is one person that is the boss, um, and they. My team knows that when we work together. That I mean, we sometimes Ross gives a ton of dentistry away because he wants to, not because it's taken from him, but he gives a lot of dentistry away. And I'll tease him and I'll say, "Today we are the we are the NPO. Today is Nash NPO Day, and that's his executive privilege. That's his his decision. My responsibility as the consultant, as the administrator, as the spouse, is to make it work, to make his dream be realized. That's my job. He is." an amazing dreamer and that's why he's so successful that's why you're so successful the successful guys are the dreamers the one who says there is nothing that gets in my that nothing's going to get in my way i'm going to make this happen my response this is what we say in the office and and i know we're running long but um for us it's a lot like curling ross is the rock he throws the rock and we sweep and that's that is what makes it so successful he's the rock thrower and we are the sweepers um, well, I want to thank you. I mean, that was that was great. So what you basically said is uh, pay attention to the org chart. I mean, there is a uh, a pope, cardinal, bishop, priest. Ex, yep. There is a general, a uh, uh, lieutenant, yep. a major, an infantry. And you're saying there is an org chart, and the there's buck a, stops with one person. Absolutely. So if there's two of you driving to work, the org stop, the org chart has got to stop with one of you. Somebody's absolutely. got to be the pope, the car, yep. the, the the general. Yep. Well, hey, I want to personally thank you for all that you've done for me over the years uh, and so many of my friends and the same to your husband. And I just want to thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. And I really uh, want my homies to fix 
their office, not with a shiny object and a course on occlusion, but, you know, fix it. And I think more people will go to your two-day course if you give them away, give away the hour intro. Like I say, those, those courses on Dental Town, they just fly out of there all day, every day. We passed half a million downloads. Yeah. Well, so, I'll be uh, happy to do that. And Howard, you have done amazing things for for dentistry, as you know, as you know, you have, um, you are, you are a rock star. And one of the reasons you are a rock star is you do stand away from the mic. Um, so <laughs> just like, just like, uh, just like Mick. So thank you. And you know, Ross, and I would love to give back to you any way we can. Well, say, go watch that movie, 10 feet from stardom. It's crazy how all the greatest musicians let those backup singer girls that they grew up singing gospel in these little Southern churches and, and uh, how they just like and Mick said, you know, I would listen to her saying it. It's like, why would I ruin the song? You know, they, he would shut up. And uh, but yeah, go watch 10 Feet from Stardom. Thank you again so much. Tell your husband I said hello. Thanks, Howard. Bye bye.